Luft Huron, chapter master of the Astral Claws and leader of the Maelstrom Warders, a faithful servant of the Imperium, or at least so he was, up until the end of the Badar War in 913 of the 41st millennium, when Luft Huron became Huron Blackheart and the Astral Claws became the Red Corsairs, and their allegiances changed along with their names. Now, the conflict itself, of course, I have already exhaustively covered in the War for Badab series, so if you're interested in a few dozen hours of backstory, you have the option to immerse yourself there, but today we are going to talk about what happened to Huron and the Red Corsairs after the invasion of Badab Primaris and the storming of the Palace of Thorns, the Astral Claw's last stronghold in the war. It was during the fighting for the palace that Huron was intercepted by a group of star phantoms, loyalist space marines under the command of Captain Zrukal and Drocales. This engagement was but one of thousands that took place during that day, as Huron and his astral claws had vowed to fight to the bitter end for their beloved sector and as skilled and determined as the Star Phantoms were, before Huron and his chosen bodyguard, they were as dust before a hurricane. In the span of no more than a few dozen mortal heartbeats, they were all destroyed, but not before Captain Androcles managed to deliver a last-ditch point-blank melter blast straight into Luft Huron himself. A shot meant to disable battle tanks left Huron mortally wounded, and the metal of his artificer forged Terminator armor permanently fused with his flesh. Even most superhuman space marines would have perished from so traumatic and devastating an injury. But Luft Huron held on as his broken and charred body was carried from the battlefield by his bodyguards. Abandoning their orders to fight to the last, a small contingent, no more than a hundred or so warriors, began a breakout attempt from the Palace of Thorns, in an effort to make it out into orbit and escape the battlefield an effort in which they were ultimately successful, as the last few ragged survivors made it in to the Maelstrom, the very thing they had once sought to destroy. Because of course, Huron's fall was never inevitable. Lesser minds will undoubtedly tell you that he was corrupted, somehow tainted, that he had ruined himself and that Luft Huron the Loyalist had not existed for many centuries. But what was his great crime? What was his unforgivable act? It was to save his brothers, the chapter's children, their successors in the Tiger Claws, who after having suffered devastating casualties were rebuked by the Imperium, their requests for replenishment denied, or even worse, possibly their representatives purged by the Inquisition. Huron accepted these few survivors into his ranks as new Astral Claws, and so began his fall his violation of the Codex Astartes, as he brought his chapter well above the 1,000 allowed battle brothers, in an effort to destroy the Maelstrom, the stable warp storm that so plagued the Badab sector, the sector of the Imperium that Huron and his warders had been charged with protecting. Now, Sure, one could argue that invading a warp storm, 
with any hope of ever fully pacifying it, might be hubris. It might be foolhardy in the extreme, but when Huron did so, alongside his allies, the Black Templars, he had significant success. It was only when the Black Templars were called away that his advantage began to slip, and his numbers came up short. So who could say what could have happened had the distant masters of the Imperium and their inquisitorial lapdogs seen fit to grant his request? If Huron had gotten his founding, mayhaps the Maelstrom could have been nothing more than just that, a stable warp anomaly. Not a den of pirates, or raiders, or chaos worshippers, but a vast stretch of dead, empty space, patrolled unceasingly, but relatively peacefully, by the new warders of the Maelstrom. Would Huron still have fallen to chaos then? Or is arrogance and ambition only flaws, only vices, when they cannot be obtained. For who, after all, chastised the Black Templars for their lax compliance with the Codex-mandated numbers? Who chastises the Wolves of Fenris and their great companies who indeed challenged Gilliman? for leading a legion in all but name against the Ruin Storm, and to reunite the two shattered halves of the Imperium. Now, Luft Huron's fall from grace was not inevitable, it was a consequence of circumstance, a result of politics, and ambition in other places than the Badab sector. Of course, no space marine, not even a Primark, can undo the past. And so, after his loyal servants had brought him into the maelstrom, and his best apothecaries and tech marines had laboured over his miraculously still alive body for the better part of a week, did Luft Huron finally arise again to survey his last few shattered, tattered, bruised, and battered survivors and see in them not servants of the God Emperor, much less so the servants of the False Imperium, but instead his warriors, his brothers, and his dead children, and so declared they were the astral claws no more, they were the red corsairs, and they would dab their armour crimson red in honour of their fallen comrades. And they would make damn sure the Imperium felt the pain of dead brothers. But there was much to be done before vengeance could be wrung from the Imperium. The Maelstrom, now Luft Huron and his renegades home, was a vast hellscape of petty kingdoms, mini empires, and pirate strongholds. The home to vile Xenos breeds, alien raiders, and near the core, demons none of which were overly welcoming of Lufthuron and his renegade marines. Unsurprising, as both parties had he been engaged in hunting the other for as long as either had existed. Business as usual, then. As Huron had no intention of allying with the scum of the Maelstrom, Subjugation, however, was most certainly on the table. And after the multiple sallies into the maelstrom conducted by the Astral Claws and the past, Lufthuron and his new Corsairs knew exactly where to find 
the less savoury elements of the maelstrom, and which ones would be easiest to bend to their will. Now, an army of pirate scum and mutant outcasts were hardly the force that Huron had once commanded, but as he had been reduced from three and a half chapters of Adeptus Astartes to less than a company, he wasn't really in a position to be choosy. And attrition to his remaining fighting forces had to be minimalized as much as possible. And if pirate scum could ever have any use, it was probably as cannon fodder. With his army thus bolstered, Huron continued his crusade in the Maelstrom, taking over dozens of pirate strongholds in rapid succession, using their resources, their plunder, and their vessels to propel him on to fresh conquests. What started as a pirate fleet, preying on the limited commerce within the Maelstrom, turned into a raiding force, capable of taking on the savage worlds found within its twisting depths. From there it became a force capable of besieging, assaulting, and conquering entire planets, turning their population into mutant slave labour for yet further conquests. Ironically, in damnation, Lufthuron managed to do what he had been denied in noble life, as he instilled a certain brand of order on the maelstrom, one created from hesitant obedience, as it became blatantly obvious that opposing the tyrant was a far less appetizing option than appeasing him. Until eventually, the Maelstrom became the Red Corsair's personal fiefdom, ruled from the orbital void station Hell's Iris, the seat of command and authority occupied by Huron Blackheart, the name granted to him by the Denzians of the Maelstrom. As you can probably gather from that, Huron was uh, not the most gracious of rulers, but he certainly was effective. He had been loved, or if not loved, then at the very least well liked by those he protected during his reign in the Badab sector, but, well, we see where that had got him. And so this time around he decided to skip the middle part and go right to efficiency. Ruling with an iron fist, he constructed entire fleets, raised armies and raiders and auxiliary forces the equal of those he once commanded in the Tyrant's Legion, all within the deep, dark, inhospitable and almost never disturbed depths of the Maelstrom. The warders had frequently carried out deep dives into its churning wastelands precisely to avoid a pirate empire from growing, to avoid the chaos heretics and the mutants within from forming an adequate level of resistance, of force and power to challenge the warders and endanger the Badab sector. But now, of course, that the warders were no more, there was nobody available to police the maelstrom. Those victorious chapters that had been granted privileges within the Badab sector had near universally been mauled to near extinction by the war, and were barely in a position to guard the sector itself, much less preemptively dive into the maelstrom to nip dangers in the bud. And so Huron was able to do as he pleased without any disturbances. In fact, as far as the Imperium was concerned, the tyrant had died during the siege of the Palace of Thorns. Years after the final defeat and scattering of the Astral Claws, the Inquisition had finally made their last report to the High Lords of Terror, declaring absolute and complete victory in the Badab sector, declaring their judgment over the traitors of the Astral Claws and their misguided allies, the Lamenters and the Mantis Warriors. 
and as for the tyrant, as I said, he was presumed to have been killed during the siege. One might imagine that the helmet camera of Androcles would have been recovered, displaying quite clearly the tyrant catching a face full of multi-melter at point-blank range. No doubt any number of medical experts could be dug out to confirm that such an injury would invariably prove fatal, and so the Imperium's foe had been vanquished, and the plaudits of the Inquisitorial representatives remained untarnished by failure. Up until the point, of course, where the reports of mysterious red armored Astartes sallying forth from the maelstrom to lead vast raiding fleets of pirates and mutants grew too frequent to continue to deny, and investigations were eventually launched, identifying the newcomers as a renegade space marines not just from the Astral Claws, but from a variety of renegade chapters who had heard of the Black Heart and his rising piratical empire. But despite the obviously mounting threat, it would be decades before a reaction could be teased forth from the exalted masters of mankind, if one could even be produced at all. For despite the Badab sector's relative mineral riches, well, it was still on the fringes of the Imperium. <laughs> the same problem that Huron had faced, namely that the Imperium simply didn't care about his portion of the galaxy, would now work to his benefit, as <laughs> mere raiding activity carried out in the hinterlands of the Imperium's border regions were not very high up on the Imperium's list of priorities, allowing Huron and his corsairs to grow richer, fatter, and bolder until they carried out one of their greatest exploits in their fallen years with the attack on Villa Moose. This planet in the Badab sector had been granted in perpetuity as a chapter homeworld as a reward to the Marines errant chapter for their part in the defeat of the Astral Claws which gave Huron and his Corsairs an opportunity to get two superhuman birds with one stone. The Marines Errant were obviously a target of vengeance for the Red Corsairs, and more practically speaking, their fortress monastery contained tremendous quantities of gene seed the precious resource required to create new space marines, a resource that the Red Corsairs had very little of, and almost no hope of procuring fresh supplies of, as the Primarch's holy gift to their chapters respond exceedingly poorly to long-term exposure to the warp like the kind of exposure one would expect to see once trapped within a stable warp storm. But taking on a gene seed vault is no small challenge. It is perhaps the single most precious resource in the entire Imperium, and as such it is obviously heavily guarded. It is literally a chapter's lifeline. And even though the Marines Errant had not been in the Badab system for so very long, they, being an Astartes chapter, had access to all of the resources they could ever want, and had constructed sizable defensive fortifications around their fresh fortress monastery. Lufthuron was going to need allies, and as it turned out, there were plenty to be had. The Maelstrom had always been home to various nefarious entities, and one of them turned out to be a warband of the Night Lords, under a Chaos Champion by the name, or more correctly, the moniker, of the Exalted. Now, trusting the Night Lords is a 
risky business in and of itself, but their expertise in infiltration would come in extreme handy for avoiding the worst of the Marine's errant defences. And so displaying a bit of his old tactical acumen, Huron devised a two-stage plan. First, his Red Corsair would demonstrate, show themselves, entice the Marines errant out to fight. And the Marines errant would come out to fight, because that is what they do. That is what they always do. Almost as soft as the salamanders they are. The moment Huron started messing around with Imperial shipping and civilian worlds in the area, their intervention was guaranteed. And as soon as the majority of their strength had abandoned their new home world, the Night Lords moved in, infiltrating the base, disabling its primary void shields and automated defensive systems. With all of that out of the way, the only thing left was a garrison of chapter serfs, and perhaps half a company or so of marines left behind. No match for a full warband of expert terror soldiers. By the time the marines errant battle force received the word of what was going on on Villamos, it was all far Far too late. The Night Lords were gone, and their booty along with them. Returning to the Maelstrom as quickly as possible, they rendezvoused with the Red Corsairs. For a little bit of backstabbing, of course. Because just like the Red Corsairs, the Night Lords too had seen an irresistible opportunity to bag two gene-enhanced birds with but a single rock. It turns out that amongst Lufthuron's new fleet, primarily made up of recaptured vessels and modified civilian ships, in the same way that he tried to build a fleet for his tyrant's guard, one of their ships was a strike cruiser, with the name Venomous Birthright. As you can tell, the Red Corsairs weren't taking their exile particularly well. And worse still was the fact that the Strike Cruiser's old name was the Echo of Damnation, a Night Lord's vessel, and they wanted it back. Securing the collaboration of a Red Corsair's apothecary, they managed to purge most of the ship's Astartes garrison out in airlock. Quite the coup, undoubtedly. This more or less delivered the ship directly into the hands of the Night Lords, but everything didn't work out quite so smoothly. In an attempt to make its escape, the Echo of Damnation warp jumped away, but an error in the navigation system, or perhaps on behalf of the navigator, saw the ship re-emerge in real space quite some distance away from its intended location, giving the Red Corsairs time to catch up with it and its partner in crime, the Covenant of Blood, the other Night Lord's vessel. The pursuit ended with the Covenant's destruction, but with the Echo's escape, and along with it, most of the gene seed as well. Huron was not particularly happy, but at least he could take some solace in the knowledge that the Marines errant, now stripped of their primary gene seed storage, would wither away over the decades and the centuries, unable to replenish their ranks reliably, until finally they would suffer the same fate as his Tiger Claws, a chapter he rescued, whose request for gene seed stock replenishment was refused by the High Lords, if indeed the representatives was not, as mentioned, outright assassinated by the Inquisition. And I guarantee you Huron would go to quite some length to make sure that the Marines errant never got so far as to dispatch an envoy of their own as this was but the first step in a general escalation of Red Corsair's activity throughout the Badab sector and beyond, as Huron had ambitions of empire, and his reach only grew. 
Huron and his Red Corsairs eventually went from simply raiding worlds or overrunning planetary defense forces to steal resources or warships to ambushing entire Imperial battle fleets, including one particularly unfortunate example for the Wolves of Fenris, where the strike cruiser, the Wolf of Fenris, was stolen from them by the Corsairs. The wolf would later be instrumental in Huron's greatest act of savagery and violence against the Imperium that betrayed him so far. When he ambushed Battlefleet Aquinas, sitting high in stationary orbit above the world of Aldarion. Employing a combination of tactical acumen, trickery, and a bit of warp sorcery, Huron and his fleet managed to ambush the mighty battle fleet as it stood at parade rest, unready to respond to a sudden attack. A sizable portion of the fleet was annihilated in the opening few salvos, and the grand battleship at the heart of the formation, the Chosen of Thor, was boarded. Its weapon systems, engines, and sensoriums taken offline by the Red Corsairs, leaving her helpless in the void, as her escort was picked apart all around her. In this engagement, Huron even chose to allow several Imperial vessels to flee unmolested, even as they received broadband open vox calls all saying the same thing, your empire is dead. You must have learned some lessons from the Night Lords. Whether or not it was worth the loss of a ship, a strike cruiser on top of it all, well, that is debatable, but it certainly got some in the Imperium thinking about what could possibly be done to deal with that damned maelstrom warp storm. Some perhaps even considering a founding to clear it out. The irony of Luft Huron continues well into the present day. He even had some exploits during the whole Gathering Storm bullshittery, including the lengthy torture of a great Khan of the White Scars. But, new lore. Distasteful, frankly. So let us instead wrap up with a little bit of a discussion as to the chaotic nature of the Red Corsairs. Because Huron, of course, had been, for the majority of his life, a fierce opponent of chaos. Today, obviously, as the Battle Fleet Aquinas incident so clearly demonstrates, his standards and uh, morals on the issue have become far more flexible with time, as he has recognized that chaos is but a tool, a weapon, something to be used and wielded against his real enemy, the Imperium. He does not allow it to claim him. Nor does he condone it claiming his brethren either, as the Red Corsairs worship chaos undivided, its most utilitarian form. Although there are those within the ranks of the Red Corsair who take a far more zealous approach to their new gods, it is far from the official line of the chapter legion in creation, perhaps, as there are rumours that Huron's might is significantly greater than what he has shown so far, and perhaps it is. The supply of gene seed would be his primary limiting factor, particularly after the betrayal with the Night Lords, so it is unlikely that he is even approaching the strength that he once had as the head of the Astral Claws. But given enough time and enough successful combat operations, who knows? Not to mention, of course, that time flows very differently within the deeper reaches of the Maelstrom. As for the employment of chaotic cults, zealots, and piratical raiders and mutants, these are but cannon fodder to Huron. They are not 
the equivalent of his tyrant guard. They could never measure up to them in loyalty, in dedication, in training, or efficiency. They stood up to other Astartes. His current ragtag band is the shallowest of shadow of that once considerable fighting force, and I am sure Huron knows that as well. In fact, I would not be surprised at all if he treated them with a degree of disdain now. But without them and without easy access to more Astartes, you make do with what you have. And his mortal followers are far more religious than the rank-and-file Red Corsairs, as they tend to be more, um, well, desperate and reaching for power wherever they can find it, even the ephemeral power of the Chaos Gods. In other words, the Red Corsairs certainly do not shrink away from utilizing Chaos, nor do they fully embrace it either, but they most certainly reject it far less than they reject the Imperium. After all, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And if Huron's ambition to crush the traitor Imperium beneath his boot will ever come to fruition, is going to need all the allies he can get. As even now, as his power is growing day by day, and the Maelstrom is expanding, another irony of his reign, he may one day regain control of his beloved Badab sector. Although I suspect his previous subjects will not welcome him back with quite the same plaudits as they once did. Until next time, I have been Arch. Thank you all very much for listening, and I hope to see you all again soon. Have a good day.